Today we're going to be reviewing the Hyundai Palisade. Now while most car reviewers would praise the Palisade for being an excellent family hauler and mall crawler, we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath this Palisade to see what's inside and how it works. And we're going to start under the hood where we have Hyundai's Lambda V6 engine. This is the 3.8 liter version of it, situated transversely for front wheel drive. And it's mated to an 8-speed automatic transmission located underneath the battery and the airbox here with a transfer case to feed the all-wheel drive system. Now taking a look at some of the components under the hood here. It is pretty generic for any front wheel drive V6 vehicle. We've got our washer tank and coolant tank over here and pretty much nothing else on this side. We've got the ABS actuator over here. Over on this side we've got our brake reservoir as well as our air intake and filter and the battery located on this side as well as the fuse box and ECU. Now we're going to start by taking a look at the air intake system on this vehicle. We've got fresh air drawn in through this duct here. It'll then get filtered out through the air box here where it then goes through this tube and then into the drive by wire throttle body and then into this plastic air intake plenum before it feeds each of the six cylinders of this engine. Now accessing the air filter is pretty straightforward. You just have to pull this down, remove these two tabs here and then pull the air filter out. The tabs are actually part of the air filter itself. Now with the whole air intake box removed, you can see it frees up a lot of space on top of the transmission side of the engine bay here. We've also got clear access to that drive-by wire throttle body. Now looking at this plenum here, it is made of plastic as well as the lower air intake plenum that mounts directly to the aluminum head. Next we're going to take a look at the fuel system on this engine. Now the low pressure fuel pump in the tank as well as the filter is going to bring fuel up to this line here, which is then going to bring it over to the high pressure fuel pump, which is this guy underneath this cover here. This cover is just there to dampen the amount of clicking sounds you get from that high pressure fuel pump. Now it's actually powered off of the intake camshaft on the front bank of the engine here. That's going to pressurize the fuel and send it back down this other pipe down underneath the air intake plenum where it gets directly injected into the combustion chamber. Now because this has only direct injection only, fuel is not sent through the ports here to wash off the intake valves which means that you could have a carbon buildup issue as the miles add up. Now taking a look at the ignition system on this engine, you can see it is a V6 engine which means that you've got three cylinders on this side and three cylinders facing the firewall. The front three plugs and ignition coils are fairly easy to access right at the front here and easy to change out. However, like most transverse V6 engines, to change the rear three plugs, it's located underneath this plastic intake plenum, which means that you have to remove this entire assembly and all the hoses and change the gaskets. The coils would be located on the top of this valve cover. Now looking at the lubrication setup on this engine, it's pretty generic. It takes 5W30 weight oil and the oil fill cap is right here, easy to access, as well as the dipstick. Now taking a look underneath the palisade, you can see most of it is pretty flat and covered up with the exception of the centerpiece. Now that's good because it will prevent salt water from splashing up rusting out components and also help with aerodynamics. Now the thing I don't like is despite half of the oil pan showing, you still have to remove the rest of this access cover on this side in order to do an oil change. It would have made more sense if they just put the oil filter and pan drain plug on this side where it's already exposed. Now with the cover removed, you can see you've got clear access to the engine on this side and the transmission over on this side. Now take Taking a look underneath here, we have a stamped steel oil pan with the drain plug located over here. This oil pan is pretty shallow, but we do have the upper oil pan, which is the aluminum part that actually bolts to the block. Now the oil filter is located over here. It's a cartridge style oil filter. Now one thing I don't like is that this oil filter housing is all made of plastic. Now with age and heat, this is going to tend to leak, especially because this has to carry all of the oil pressure from the oil pump since it's the first thing in the circuit that filters all the oil. Now taking a look at the front of this engine here, which is the passenger side, you've got the drive belt set up and it's just a single drive belt, which is pretty straightforward. You've got the crank pulley down there, the water pump up at the top here. Then over at the front here, you can see the alternator and then way down at the bottom there is the AC compressor access from below. Now changing out this drive belt is pretty straightforward. Just stick a wrench on there to loosen off that tensioner and then you can get access to this belt. Now the alternator is down in a pretty tight spot with the engine kind of hanging over it from the top here and also being so close to the front of the vehicle. Luckily though you don't need to remove the front end in order to access it. You can access it from down below but you will have to drop the AC compressor out. Now from the bottom here we've got a better view of that drive belt setup. You can see the crankshaft and the AC compressor as well as your alternator located at the top here. Now reaching that alternator requires that you do remove this AC compressor. It's got a couple of bolts here and it'll drop down. Now in and behind that drive belt setup is even more importantly the timing chain setup. Now there's actually three chains on this engine. One that powers the front bank, one that powers the rear bank and then one at the bottom that powers the oil pump. Now this engine has double overhead cams with variable valve timing on both the intake side which you can see here and the exhaust side underneath this cover here. Now the intake side 
side uses a forced solenoid in order to change the phase of the camshaft using oil pressure, while the exhaust side uses a more traditional oil control valve, and that's actually buried underneath this valve cover here. There's also another set of those at the back here and here. Now I've already got another video on how variable valve timing works, so you might want to check that out in the link above. Now the Palisades engine setup's got three main engine mounts. You've got one located on the passenger side over here supporting the engine. The other one is located on the driver's side here, which supports the transmission on this frame rail. And the third engine mount is located at the bottom here. It's called a roll mount because it basically prevents the engine from rolling back and forth against those two top mounts. And now we'll have a listen to the engine. Now next we'll take a look at this 8-speed automatic transmission. Now looking from the top underneath this battery tray here, you can see these wires, they're going to lead to an electric motor that sits on top of this transmission and that's to select the gears between park, reverse, neutral and drive. Because this is a shift by wire system, there's no physical cable that goes underneath the dash to the transmission. Now just next to that motor we have the fill port which is this hex bolt here that you remove in order to fill transmission fluid when doing a fluid change. Now Hyundai doesn't really want you to service their transmission so there's no repair information available for it. Instead you just got to replace it when it failed. Now the top here you can see these two fluid lines that will bring transmission fluid to get cooled off into the radiator and then send it back out. There's no separate transmission cooler here. Now one thing I don't like about this transmission is that you can't easily check your transmission fluid level and the quality to see if it's dirty. You have to instead rely on the drain port and the check port down below. Now taking a look underneath this transmission here you can see you've got this plastic valve body cover. Now on the valve body cover we have this check plug here which is what you would use to check the transmission fluid level. The excess would drain out at a certain temperature and then over here you've got the drain plug. Now this transmission uses an electric ATF pump which is going to help in your idle stop mode to engage the transmission in the correct gear and also gain some efficiencies. Now one thing you might have to service on this transmission pretty frequently is the starter because this has the idle stop start system that everyone hates and it might take a toll on the starter over a while. Now it is located right above the automatic transmission fluid pump and it is pretty easy to access with just a couple of bolts and it'll drop down. Now once the transmission is done shifting its gears, it's going to send its power to the differential which is going to ultimately power the front wheels through these axles that you see here. However, this part over here is where the transfer case is located for the all-wheel drive system. Now the transfer case has a fill plug located way over here and a drain plug because you do have to service this transfer case fluid. Now it's going to transfer power directly to the drive shaft located underneath the vehicle here at the back. Now that drive shaft is going to head down to the back here to this rear differential assembly. Now this is where the all-wheel drive system is going to kick in. We've got this little electric motor here based on certain parameters. It's going to turn on a clutch system here in order to send power out to the rear wheels through these little axles. Now of course the axles back here are pretty small diameter compared to the front because this is primarily a front wheel drive vehicle. It's not a real four-wheel drive or off-roader type of vehicle but don't get me wrong it can probably handle the occasional snowbank at your grocery store parking lot. Now comparing the size of the axles this one's the passenger side at the front you can see this one's nice and chunky and that's because most of the torque goes to the front wheels here. Now the CV axles are then going to send power to these rear hubs here which are luckily a bolted on design so if you have to change bearings it's pretty straightforward and you don't need a press. Now taking a look at the front suspension setup on the Hyundai Palisade things are pretty standard here with the McPherson strut suspension that ties into this aluminum knuckle. Now the bottom here we've got our stamp steel lower control arm as well as your inner and outer tie rods and here you can see the sway bar as it comes out to the link. Now this type of McPherson strut suspension is kind of expected in this class of family vehicle. It is a very simple setup which is going to last a fairly long time compared to say a multi-link or a double wishbone setup like say on the Ford Explorer. Now working on this is pretty easy. You've got your tie rods which are easily accessible on the inside there as well as on the outside over here. We've got our lower control arm here which is bolted once over here and one over there. Even the lower ball joint is bolted onto that control arm so changing out the control arm and even the ball joint should be pretty easy. The only thing I don't like about the ball joint is this pinch bolt design. Sometimes it kind of gets stuck in there and a little hard to get out. Now with an aluminum knuckle you've also got bolted on bearings. You can see the bolts located over here so you don't need a press to change it out. 
Now the front here you've got this long slender stabilizer link that connects up to the strut and of course you've got a lot of room in here to work on. Everything bolts up to this stamped steel subframe. Now the only thing I'd like to see here is more use of aluminum the way say Nissan has done with the Murano. Using stamped steel here kind of screams cost cutting measures although this isn't really a luxury SUV. Now one thing I find very interesting especially with a lot of newer vehicles is that the front subframe is actually just there to tie the suspension components together. This one is a stamped steel design. It actually doesn't extend anywhere further in front of the powertrain assembly. In fact, the only structural member that goes past the powertrain assembly is this front frame rail here, which joins to the bumper reinforcement behind the plastic bumper skin. Other than that, all of this under here is your plastic radiator support that supports the bumper, the headlights, and everything up at the front here. It doesn't really serve any structural purpose. I kind of wish they didn't use hard plastic here and instead use the more sound deadening material like the carpet they use in the back. So you've got nice fuzzy soft touch materials even in the well liners at the back. Now taking a look at the rear suspension on the Hyundai Palisade you can see you've got a multi-link setup at the back here and that's going to be good for handling purposes but probably not as solid for say an off-road purposes or towing purposes like say a solid axle design but let's be honest that's not really what this vehicle is meant for. Now all of these components back here are made of a stamped steel design which is a bit of a cost cutting measure over say the use of aluminum components. Now you'll notice that the rear lower control arm we've got three different mounting points one for your stabilizer link here's where your coil spring sits and the other one where the shock absorber sits. Now these are all going to have different motion ratios which are going to be accounted for in the design. Now working on the suspension shouldn't be too difficult we've got one bolt at the bottom there and just two bolts at the top here if your shock absorbers do wear out they should be pretty easy to swap out. And taking a look at the other components at the front here we've got our trailing arm then the top here we've got our upper control arm then on the front here we've got your front lower control arm that ties into the knuckle and then of course we've got that rear lower control arm here so there's a total of four links that make up the suspension. Now the knuckle is made of aluminum supposedly to save weight but it does have quite a thick presence over here between the control arms and the actual mounting face of the wheel which is what's going to give you a very big offset on these wheels. Now one thing I kind of find dangerous is this exposed fuel filler neck. If fuel is in here and something from the wheel kicks up and ruptures this that could be a potential safety hazard. I'd rather if they had it fully covered. Now taking a look at the Palisade suspension from underneath here you can see we've got a stamped steel subframe we've got our adjustment for camber over here for this lower control arm and here we've got this little stabilizer link that kind of plugs into the control arm here and the sway bar runs underneath here and ties into the subframe over here at this bushing. Now here's a look at that trailing arm here where it ties into the body at the front here at two points and then leads out to the knuckle here. Now next we'll take a look at the exhaust setup Now because this is a V6 engine there's going to be one bank that comes off this way and the other bank that comes off this way. It's a little difficult to see but the exhaust manifold comes off of the head and then it goes directly into a catalytic converter located over here. Now the same thing happens at the back here although it's a little difficult to see where the catalytic converter is. Now here's a better look at that front catalytic converter from underneath. It'll then lead out to this flex pipe before joining up with the Y pipe underneath here. And just above that Y pipe is the rear catalytic converter. The exhaust will then flow over this subframe and into another flex pipe another catalytic converter and then out the back. Now that exhaust is then going to travel over to this mid muffler and then out over here to this bigger rear muffler and then out the tailpipe. This car has only got 3,000 kilometers and it's already building up with soot. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust. Next we'll take a look at the cooling system of the Palisade. Now this is pretty straightforward because this is a naturally aspirated engine. Now we'll start here at the water pump which is pretty easy to access just underneath this engine mount here. You just have to remove these bolts here to get the pulley off and then you've got easy access to all of the bolts here that bolt it directly to the block. At least it's pretty straightforward unlike other engines that drive it off of the timing chain. Now off to the side here we have our coolant expansion tank and I'm glad that it's actually just an expansion tank and not a pressurized system where the radiator cap is here. It's on the radiator where it's supposed to be. Now taking a look at the radiator itself, it is buried inside of this radiator cradle here which is actually made of plastic and we've also got the cooling fan located at the front here. Now in order to replace this radiator you have to remove the entire front bumper skin as well as this radiator support in order to remove the fan and radiator as an assembly. Now taking a look from this side we have clear access to the fan here. There's only a single electric fan on the front of this despite this vehicle being so big. We've also got a look 
look at the upper radiator hose as it goes into this coolant pipe here as well as the lower radiator hose. Now down here at the lower radiator hose you can see that it's got an electric thermostat inside of this housing which means that the computer can manually melt the wax inside of this thermostat to get coolant to flow a little bit earlier for better fuel economy. And from underneath here you can also see that cooling fan and the lower radiator hose. Now perhaps one last thing you have to worry about is that there's no active grill shutters behind this bumper skin so that's one last thing you might have to replace if it gets damaged. Now in terms of electronics complexity under the hood there's nothing really here that's extravagant for a 20th century vehicle. You've got your normal wiring harness sprawled across the top of the engine. You do have a smaller computer module located over here and then the main ECU is located over here. I like that it is set back a little bit from the crumple zone so it's not the first thing to get damaged if you get into a fender bender. Now over here we've got a nicely laid out fuse box that's even labeled underneath here. Looks like these are even pre-wired for a trailer kit even though this one does not have a towing package. Even the battery is right up at the front here, nice and center, easy to swap out. It's not buried in the fender somewhere. Now even despite the unique styling and placements of the headlights down inside the bumper, it's actually pretty easy to get to the headlight bulbs if you have to change them. Now here's a look behind the bumper cover at the headlight assembly. It's a pretty big unit and it's got these little heat sinks on the back here to cool off the LED drivers. Although you probably won't be changing LED bulbs and have to change the whole assembly if anything's wrong. They've even got this old school diagnostic port right at the top here. Probably use that in the factory. And next we'll take a look at the brake system on the Hyundai Palisade. Now things are very traditional here. We've got a standard vacuum assisted power booster which takes its vacuum straight from the air intake plenum. There's no need for a vacuum pump like say on a turbocharged vehicle. Now over here you do have a pressure sensor so that the computer knows if there's enough pressure in there to hit the brakes for the autonomous braking feature. And the braking system continues from the master cylinder over to the ABS actuator located over here which is responsible for your ABS, your traction and stability control as well as the autonomous braking features that this car has. Now speaking of autonomous braking there is a lot of sensors on the front of this vehicle so if you ever get into a bumper accident and have to replace this bumper skin it's going to be pretty expensive. You've got your radar sensor located on this black piece down here. You've also got your little parking sensors over here as well as a little camera at the front here. Now that's of course in addition to the sensor that you've got up at the top of the windshield. Now taking a look at the Hyundai Palisades front brakes. This is a heavy vehicle so as to be expected we have a dual piston caliper at the front here on this disc rotor. And of course things can get pretty hot while you're racing this on the highway to go to school. You do have the obligatory vent here which is going to dry and cool air from the front of the vehicle to cool off the brake. Now taking a look at the rear brakes on the Hyundai Palisade you can see you've got our standard disc rotor with our caliper design. You've got a electric parking brake at the back here which actuates a gear set to squeeze these together when you actuate the parking brakes. It's not something you usually like but it's going to be better than say seizing up parking brake cables especially for the people who drive these probably won't even use their parking brake. Now the steering system in the Palisade uses a column mounted electric power steering motor. Now most of that is hidden because you can't really see it behind this knee airbag but you can see the shaft go down to the steering rack. And on this side of the firewall you can see where that shaft goes down to the power steering rack mounted on the subframe down below. Now there's an interesting gas pedal setup it's hinged at the bottom. Now underneath the Palisade you can see here we've got the plastic fuel tank. We've also got the EVAP canister which is located just in front of it underneath that front cover there. I like that they give you a proper spare tire down here but I wish that it was actually inside the vehicle protected away from the elements. Now one interesting thing at the back here is you've got your normal impact bar that's made of steel and that's tied together by the two frame rails but then you've also got this other impact bar that sits a little bit lower that's probably to prevent anybody from underriding this vehicle if it does get into a rear end accident. Now at the top here you've also got your rear impact sensor so if you get rear ended it'll activate your active headrest. Overall I think Hyundai's built a vehicle that definitely serves its purpose by giving people all the creature comforts and electronics on the inside with interesting styling on the outside. However I think under the hood and underneath the Palisade Hyundai's played it a little too conservative by just going with the simple V6 engine and an automatic transmission as well as this suspension set up straight out of the Kia Sorento. However that could work well for buyers who just want a simple SUV that's going to probably last fairly long because you've got a naturally aspirated V6 and an automatic transmission as well as a simple suspension setup. It's going to be pretty easy to work on compared to say a turbocharged engine or a CVT or any Ford for that matter. <laughs> now make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next car review is going to be and subscribe for more videos just like this one.